Hello and welcome everyone. I am Chris Hyams, CEO of Indeed, and welcome to the next installment of Here to Help. This is our look at how Indeed has been navigating the global impact of COVID-19. Today is July 20th. We are on day 139 of Global Work From Home. And I am delighted today to be joined by Deepa Somasundari, the Director of Strategic Projects at Indeed. Deepa has been with us for over eight years now and is based out of our London office. Although, of course, today she is working from home. Deepa, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me, Chris. So let's start where we always start, which is how are you doing right now? Um, I'm doing pretty well uh, right now. Um, last week was the uh, last week in um, the school year for my two daughters aged four and nine. So that's a bit of a relief that um, don't have to do any more homeschooling for the next um, six weeks. Um, but other than that, it's been good. Um, it was a long weekend as well um, because of the U Day. So uh, I also want to take this opportunity to thank you and the leadership team for this amazing initiative where um, all of us get to take the time off globally throughout the company. So uh, thank you for that. But in general, the last few months have been um, quite OK. Initially, to be honest, I felt a little bit overwhelmed just with the thought of um, how I'm going to manage two kids uh, from home all day long, as well as both my husband and I working from home too, full time. But uh, they've coped actually really well. So, um, and also feel lucky that we've all been uh, healthy and safe. So doing pretty good, thank you. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. It's certainly been um, a challenging time for a lot of people and it's been really helpful to think about as we're interacting with our clients and, uh, and with job seekers to understand that everyone is got their own version of the challenges that they're dealing with now. But yes, we are certainly fortunate to be able to have jobs that we can do from home right now uh, when so many people don't. Let's back up before we start diving into what we're doing today and talk a little bit about your career at Indeed. So you've been here for, for over eight years. Um, tell us a little bit about the the roles that you had and, and what you've done and, and kind of what's kept you motivated Indeed through all this time. Eight years. Um, it's, it seems like a long time, but it's actually gone really, really quick. Uh, when I joined um, Indeed, um, I joined as a client support specialist in the London office. Um, I think there were about uh, 10 or 12 people in the uh, company at that point. And um, it was a very small office. We had one meeting room in the basement that we shared with another company uh, in the same building. Very teeny tiny kitchen uh, with a shared fridge uh, with another company again. So um, it was really small, but it felt like a family. We all sat together. I remember an event that we went to. I think that was my at least the first event. Um, we didn't have um, marketing or events team at that time. So we rocked up at this convention center with a white tablecloth um, and indeed banner and our laptops. We spread the white tablecloth on uh, the desk or the table um, that we had, put the Indeed banner in the background, and uh, we spent our time educating the clients the difference between a job search engine and a job board, um, trying to explain to them the concept of um, paper performance and cost per click, and also the fact that we don't have contracts, which uh, sounded crazy to some of our clients back then. Um, so at that point, I think the only paid product that we had was um, advertising on Indeed to send free click, uh, to send clicks to um, the um, uh, to the uh, jobs. But later on, we slowly started introducing other products like CV database, um, which is resume, uh, company pages targeted ads um, and slowly getting closer to the hire uh, with now a full product suite that would help the clients make the hire like SIFT and Indeed hire. So um, it's been it's been a great journey over the last eight years to see like how we all started from just sending clicks to uh, getting closer and closer to the hire. And um, with this growth, we saw revenue growth as well as the teams uh, growing. Um, within my time at Indeed, um, I actually like we moved six different offices because that's how much the teams grew. Um, 
And uh, with that also gave me the opportunity to uh, grow from a client support specialist to managing the client success teams for um, the UK and then expanded to India and Australia. And um, then middle of last year, I got the opportunity to work um, in the global sales and client success strategy team um, on an acquisition that we made um, of a company called ClickIQ. So uh, it's been a great journey so far. And um, I think the three things that kept me at Indeed uh, for the last eight years is one, um, there is so much to learn. Um, as you can see, there is like so much of innovation and new products um, that comes with uh, different processes. So there's always something to learn every day. Um, second, the mission of helping people get jobs. Uh, working in the client success team and the strategy team gave me um, exposure to uh, seeing all the different decisions that are being made either uh, by our product team or the leadership or search quality on how they keep job seekers in the center of the decisions that they make. Uh, we've seen instances where we've walked away from revenue because something was not um, a good job seeker experience. So um, that's been amazing to see how we live um, for the mission. And um, last but not the least, the people. Um, I mean, you can have the best processes and the product in the world, but the people make the most difference. And uh, for me, I've lived in the UK for 13 years and eight out of those years I spent at Indeed. And um, it's my like my second family, you know. Uh, I've made so many friends for life now. And um, also the leadership that I have um, helped me grow, not just in my career, but as a person as well. So um, that's what's kept me at Indeed. And I hope I stay uh, many more years with Indeed. That's great. So um, let's talk a little bit about uh, your background. So you're a member at Indeed of our Asian Network Inclusion Resource Group, um, and you grew up in India. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your experience of living and working in different countries and different cultures? Yep, sure. Um, so I was born in India and I grew up there uh, up until I was 24. Uh, I lived with my mom, dad, my brother and my grandmother. Uh, we belonged to a simple middle class family. We, um, uh, the community was like uh, very close and um, uh, very dear to us. So uh, we knew everybody um, in the neighborhood. Uh, we'd play on the streets the whole day, um, play in mud and river. Um, so it was, uh, it was great. Um, because my grandmother lived with us, uh, we would um, spend all our time like hearing stories from her. Um, I don't know if you have these um, here, uh, I've never experienced in the UK, but in India you have power cuts, like uh, the electricity would cut off uh, because of the shortage. So that will happen quite often um, and it will happen for a few hours sometimes um, during the nights as well. So uh, when that used to happen, my grandmother, she'd take like a big bowl, she'd uh, put rice, yogurt, um, uh, lentils, uh, vegetable curries, mix everything. And we all would go up to the terrace um, and sit in a circle like me, my brother, some kids from the neighborhood. We'll all sit in a circle and she'll make like these little bo balls out of the rice and she'll put it in our hand and we will all eat it like one by one. And uh, um, she would um, tell us stories while she was doing that and uh, we'd all sleep on the terrace. So these were like the unplanned uh, sleepover playdates for us. Um, so this is how I grew up, like uh, in a very closed like um, community setting in my own bubble. And um, when I was 24, uh, I finished my graduation and I was working um, for a few years. Um, I got married. Um, I had an arranged marriage uh, to a man that I had just met once. Um, and he was living in the UK at that time. So um, I had to move to the UK. Um, he, uh, he came back after our wedding. He came back. Uh, initially like first uh, and then I had to wait for a couple of months um, to sort out my visa and uh, the uh, journey from Chennai to Heathrow was like the longest journey um, for me uh, because I felt so nervous. That was my first time that I was traveling outside the country and also my first time going on a flight. So super nervous. Um, I was on the flight 
um, didn't know half of the things that were on the menu, didn't know how to use um, the fork and the and the knife properly. And I was like, oh my God, I don't know how many, how many hours this feels, like the 10 hours felt like 100 hours. Uh, finally um, reached at Heathrow and I was standing in this immigration queue thinking, not sure what the immigration officer is going to ask. Um, but my major concern was like, if I'm going to understand the accent um, of like the questions that he's going to ask. Um, finished all of that. And finally, when I saw my husband at the arrivals, that was such a relief. Um, so we started living um, in London and um, I think I kind of like started relearning everything, you know, um, because it was such a big change and um, the culture was so different um, and everything like basics uh, were different. Didn't know like what a formal wear is versus a casual and then there's a middle uh, a business casual, like when to wear what. Um, what the uh, different words were, the accent, the food, um, and even basic things like um, how to use a microwave or an oven or a dishwasher. Like we didn't have these things at home. So learning all of these um, and also <laughs> learning to know more about my husband because um, I had met him just once before marrying, uh, marrying him. So uh, now when I think back, it feels um, crazy, but it was it was a really um, beautiful journey. Um, and we've been married now for 13 years, have two beautiful daughters um, who now correct um, the pronunciations or um, the grammar errors for us. So, um, but um, I'm lucky actually to have uh, the best of both worlds, you know, to have the um, culture of Indi uh, India, but also uh, to be able to adapt to the English culture and um, experience both of them. So um, it's been a good uh, 13 years so far. That's an amazing story. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so you came to the UK 13 years ago and then you started your career. How did you approach your career development? Um, my career development, to be honest, at the beginning, um, I think I felt um, very less confident because of the um, cultural shift. Um, I think I created a lot of barriers in my mind um, about um, maybe I don't, uh, I won't fit into this culture or I don't speak English as well as the others because it was not my first language or I might not understand the accent. So uh, there were a lot of uh, barriers that I had put in my mind by myself um, and it took a while for me to um, come out of that and realize that um, people appreciate the values and your skills and capability and um, the lifestyle and um, the language doesn't matter as much. Um, plus I've had some really good leaders um, at Indeed um, like Diane and Hines, who uh, trusted me more than I trusted myself and saw the capability in me and helped me grow into um, uh, grow in my career, uh, but also helped me uh, make a better person um, that I am. So um, I get to learn so much from the leadership as well. So, um, yeah, I feel, feel pretty good now um, that after this amazing journey, I'm sitting today with uh, the CEO and interviewing uh, here. So, <laughs> Well, so you've done a huge amount for Indeed over the years, and you talked a little bit about some of the different roles that you had. Um, so we're going to we're going to move in a minute into, you know, what started happening this spring with the outbreak of COVID-19. But uh, catch us up a little bit. What were you working on in 2020 right before all of that happened? Sure. Um, so as I said um, earlier, we acquired a company called uh, ClickIQ and um, I was working on um, uh, integrating that company. So for people who don't know uh, what ClickIQ is, it's a platform um, that uses automation and um, artificial intelligence to make sure that the client's spend goes to the right place. Um, so I was working on um, integrating that within the Indies systems and um, slowly rolling that out to the UK markets and um, trying to expand that to US and um, other European markets at the beginning of uh, 2020. So then springtime rolls around and um, our London office was one of the first offices. We've talked in this podcast a lot about kind of what happened at the beginning of the COVID-19 outbreak and uh, things started for us in our Singapore office. That was the first place where 
we had an employee as family member who had uh, potentially been exposed. But pretty quickly, when we start started seeing where people had been traveling, the, the London office and the Dublin office and some of these other offices were places where we started to, to get uh, worried about the health and safety of our employees and started talking about shutting down offices. Talk me through a little bit about um, what was going on in, in the UK office as, as these things were happening and how did the UK team respond to, to these early shifts? Sure. Um, so when we um, closed uh, down the offices in early March, um, I think we were one of the first um, companies to do that. And that's when it actually struck me that this is going to be quite serious than I had um, thought of before. And in the following uh, days and weeks, it became very clear uh, about the various um, companies that were furloughing employees. And on the other hand, there was a list of companies that needed um, essential workers on a very urgent basis. So um, the team in the UK started reaching out to these companies and the government bodies, offering them philanthropic support. And uh, out of this, NHS was um, one of the main or the main um, organizations that we wanted to help um, during this crisis. So can you tell for, for the folks who are not in the UK, can you give a little background on the NHS? Who, who are they and, and what was our relationship uh like with them before? So the NHS are the National Health Services. It's a publicly funded healthcare system of the UK. Um, it was established in 1948 and one of, it was one of the main social reforms uh, after the Second World War. And the uh, founding principles of the NHS is that it's universal, um, it's comprehensive and um, it is free at the point of delivery. Um, NHS is also um, the biggest employer in Europe with 1.3 million employees and um, also one of the biggest employers um, in the world. And um, it is the beloved institution of the UK. You know, uh, when you walk outside um, in the streets today, you'll find everywhere uh, posters of I love NHS or thank you NHS. Uh, we've got one in our front door uh, made by the kids with like a little rainbow which says I love NHS. So um, it is, um, NHS is our pride. So how did Indeed's relationship with NHS begin? With um, this big offer uh, of an organization, um, also it is very complex and decentralized. Um, so NHS is formed um, out of more than 200 trusts. And uh, within each trust, there are a bunch of um, hospitals and um, general practitioner surgeries in a very decentralized manner. Uh, before COVID, um, we were working with individual trusts here and there in a very ad hoc manner. Um, but when COVID um, hit, uh, we have um, a person called Clive, um, who, uh, who is the uh, director at the uh, uh, decentralized accounts team. Uh, who is also super passionate about NHS, not just because of COVID, but he has been uh, for years. Um, so he was working with um, NHS professionals, which is one of the arms um, to help with some of the rapid um, response service um, campaign to hire. And um, that's how it all started. So um, we started working with NHS professionals, but it also became very clear that there are so many other parts of NHS that needed help and in a much bigger scale. So um, Clive reached out to a few um, members of um, the client success team, the strategy team to see like what we could do. Um, and um, there were a couple of members from the strategy team, especially uh, Richard Story and uh, Ollie Braid, who um, made really good progress in reaching out to some of the senior stakeholders uh, in various different uh, parts of the NHS and having conversations on how we can help them. And at that point, we also met with um, our own senior leadership team to see uh, what we could do. And it was very clear uh, that um, we would do anything that we could. And uh, Chris, you were part of some of those uh, conversations that we had with the NHS. And you mentioned that um, we don't build ventilators, but we help people get jobs. 
Um, sorry to put you on spot, but I just wanted to <laughs> check if you wanted to share any thoughts or anything that you that was going through in your mind at that time. Yeah, so we've we've talked about this some on this podcast. It was a really amazing opportunity for us. Really, once things got stabilized, that we realized that um, how fortunate we were that you know we can do our jobs remotely and that the company was healthy and that everyone had indeed um, had a job and and was going to be able to be working through this. That um, we immediately tried to you know be led by our mission which is to help people get jobs and, and where, where is their need? And, um, and it was clear that there were, as, as you said, at the outset, a number of employers who were shutting down, who were furloughing workers, but then there were a, a number of organizations, NHS clearly being one of them, where there was really urgent need. Um, and, and in the case of the NHS, obviously it's the health and safety of, of the country as a whole. And so, this is not just our mission of helping people get jobs, but this is where our mission aligns with with doing what's most important in in the world right now and and helping people uh, through this crisis. So it became really clear that um, if we were going to help, that the best thing we could do is just very clearly offer that help and say, you know, look, this is not a sales call. We're just we're just here to here to help. That's the the name of this series here um, in in any way that we could. And it was really amazing, you know, once that people are often skeptical of, hey, we want to help you and, and we're not asking for money. What's the catch is sort of the normal thing. But once we once we started talking uh, to NHS and, and other organizations like them, it was just clear how much help people needed, that they were really eager to, uh, to open up the doors and, and let us help um, however we could. And it was clearly, you mentioned some of the, the folks uh, involved who, who did a great job of, of making those connections and, and letting those conversations start. But, but, you know, my, my job ended after the, you know, Hey, this is, this is a, this is an offer from us. You all then stepped in and, and did all the work. Um, so I, so I'd love to talk a little bit about some of the things that we did there, because this is, this is a really amazing and, and kind of unique opportunity for indeed to really just step in and, and figure out all the different ways that we could help. Um, one of the interesting projects was around the, the Nightingale hospitals. And um, can you talk a little bit about what that uh, what those are and then how, how we helped with that project in particular? Sure. Um, so the Nightingale hospitals are um, temporary hospitals that were built across um, the convention centres in the UK. So this was in anticipation of um, a surge in the coronavirus cases. And um, if um, the regular hospitals were not able to cope with the number, then the overflow can be moved over to the Nightingale hospitals um, and treated there. So uh, this actually was one of the top priorities for the government and um, to be able to uh, set this up they needed thousands of clinical and non-clinical workers um, so we started working with uh, them to be uh, to help them uh, make these hires um, and um, two things that were important or where the challenge was the volume that they needed but also the urgency um, and we did a few different things to help them uh, the first one was um, because of the circumstances, the candidates that we were driving to them um, had to be in a specific radius mile. Um, so the candidates are not passing on the virus from one town to the other. So this was a specific need uh, during this situation. So our client success team worked with the incubator team to create custom screener um, processes in the application workflow. So we could provide the candidates that uh, met the criteria set out by uh, the NHS and the government. Um, the second thing that we did was helping the candidates through the uh, complex application process. As you can imagine, with um, especially with the clinical workers, there comes a ton of compliances that they have to follow and the application process is not straightforward. So um, it was broken into different phases. And um, when we did the first phase of application process, a, a few members from the sales team, from the client success team and strategy team reached out to the qualified applicants and guided them through uh, to the next process of the um 
hiring by telling them uh, what to do and how to go through the screening process based on what um, answers they had given previously. And um, the third one was um, helping them with sourcing. And um, as I said, volume and urgency was um, um, was top, but they also uh, needed resources to do that in a much quicker uh, time. So we helped them with um, sourcing. Um, Again, this group uh, was able to uh, go through our CV database and filter out the candidates that met the criteria and uh, we were reaching out to candidates. Um, but we also worked with the incubator team to see if there is a better way and um, an automated way to do that. And uh, within a few days, they were able to build a query of um, all the candidates that were in our CV database that met the criteria and automatically sent an invitation to these potential candidates for them to apply. Um, and for people who don't know about the incubator team, um, they are um, amazing to work with, first of all, and um, they built these um, bespoke solutions and reporting tools that are not available um, in our core products um, built uh, that's built out. So if we know what the client's pain points are and what criteria they have and um, uh, that is not available in our core products, then the incubator team was very quickly able to build these uh, bespoke solutions for the client. So um, in combination of all of these uh, with free access to our platform and increased visibility and the resources that we provided, um, they were able to um, get thousands of hires um, within seven weeks and were able to set these um, hospitals up in time for the peak. Yeah, this was a, a big source of pride, I think, for the team to really be able to have uh, an impact and to move as, as quickly as we did. Um, and so thankfully in, in the UK, um, uh, a lot of the work that was done throughout the, uh, the country helped to, to slow down um, the spread. And you know, once the peak of the pandemic had passed, there was still a lot of work to do. So you know, what, kind of ha what happened next and what were some of the uh, ongoing uh, urgent hiring needs that, um, that we moved on to next? The next one was uh, the focus on healthcare support workers. So as the peak passed, uh, they needed thousands of healthcare support workers um, to be hired again um, urgently in a very short time frame. So um, we did that in two phases. Um, initially, we started off with uh, doing the invitation to apply using the incubator team, which within a few days delivered um, around 300 applicants uh, to them. And uh, the next phase was um, we used our advertising platform with the uh, funding that we got from our senior leadership and we were able to deliver uh, more than 5,000 candidates in a few days. Um, and out of those 5,000 candidates, 3,000 of them were qualified and uh, moved to the pre-employment check. So that was um, a, an amazing thing and the client was super happy about it. Um, but then um, soon there was um, another challenge that they had. Um, out of all the candidates that we had sent them, uh, more than 1,500 candidates needed additional screening and uh, they didn't have the resources to do uh, those, uh, that screening. So a few weeks ago, um, we got a call from the client on a Thursday uh, afternoon saying, um, can you help us screen these 1,500 plus candidates that we have um, and you have three days to do that. Uh, we said, yeah, we will. Uh, and um, soon after the call, we spent the whole afternoon and uh, uh, late throughout the evening figuring out a few things. Uh, first, finding out the resources um, to uh, be able to call these 1,500 candidates and screen them. So we reached out to various different teams uh, across EMEA and US and um, to see like who has the bandwidth to help with this. Um, the second thing that we did was worked with the Indeed Hire team um, to build out the whole screening process um, for uh, the screening to happen the next day. And the third one was building out um, reporting tools. Uh, so we have the correct data to see how many candidates we have screened and provide them back to the 
client and uh, the last one was training content uh, to put up the training content to train all the ingredients who would be doing the screening because it was um, something new that we hadn't done before for the NHS and we didn't know the process um, the screening process for them so we did all of this um, overnight and uh, next day morning uh, when we woke up it was overwhelming to see that 150 indeed employees had volunteered to help across uh, various teams like sales client success talent acquisition content acquisition um, indeed hire across um, uk ireland and netherlands germany france india us and mexico so that was just crazy um, in the morning um, Around 9 to 10, we did the first batch of training uh, for the EMEA um, employees and they started calling the candidates at around, I think, 11 o'clock. Um, and in about three and a half hours, uh, they were able to complete all the um, uh, phone calls. Um, so the initial ask from the client was to call the 1,500 candidates. Um, and we did that in about three and a half hours instead of three days. So uh, we called the client, um, uh, they were super happy um, and we offered to do a second round of calls for the candidates who we were not able to reach in the first round. Um, so we did another set of training for our US colleagues in the afternoon and um, they started calling the clients later on in the evening on Friday and continued to do some more calls um, the next week uh, with the help of the talent acquisition team. So overall, we were able to call all of the 1,500 plus candidates, uh, called more than 900 candidates twice. And um, within these like um, few hours of work, we were able to deliver 300 hires for the NHS uh, on top of the um, 3,000 qualified candidates that we had sent in the first place. So. Um, it was, it was such a nice feeling um, to see the impact that we had made, uh, but also it was so nice to see so many people coming together to help um, across various teams and uh, various countries. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everybody that was part of this project and that helped voluntarily um, to make us like uh, fulfill NHS's goal. Yeah, it, it's a beautiful story. It really is, to me, um, just a perfect illustration of what the mission of Indeed actually means. When we say we help people get jobs, you know, we are willing to go to any lengths uh, to do that. And this this is this is really uh, inspirational. And, and I thank you for, for retelling that story. So you mentioned a couple times the, the incubator. Um, for folks who don't know about the incubator, it's a, an internal, essentially startup incubator that we have where any employee in the company uh, once a quarter could come and pitch any ideas that they have. And we give funding and have, uh, have done well over 100 new products over the last five years. But along with this uh, platform, we have a dedicated team of designers and data scientists and engineers and, and product managers uh, who go along and staff these projects. And we essentially, when things shifted at the beginning of COVID and wanted to go and help out on projects like this, we were able to tap into this team who were equally inspired to, to go and, and throw their time and energy towards helping out. Can you talk a little bit about the, the partnership that, that your team had with the incubator and, and the role that they played here? So the um, incubator team was um, super helpful in creating um, solutions that um, was not available in our core products. Um, so initially, um, they uh, helped us build the um, invite to apply in a much more customized way that took a lot of the uh, time that we would have spent doing the sourcing of candidates manually. Like, uh, I think we were about, um, I don't know, five or six people uh, going through the CV uh, database and manually contacting each of the candidates that we um, thought were potential candidates based on the criteria. And they were able to build a custom um, solution and were able to send um, those invitations in thousands um, 
overnight. So, um, and also they were able to build the reporting um, to be able to see like how many candidates have uh, applied and uh, we can then tweak and uh, reform the um, queries. Um, they helped us build a banner uh, and put that up on um, the Indeed site that we hadn't done before. Um, so things like that, like knowing the client's pain points and trying to figure out a solution uh, rather than to fit a product into uh, them was what they uh, really helped us with. And um, that created a a trust between um, the client and us, which was um, which I think will go a long way. So you've been with Indeed for eight years. You've certainly seen a lot. Um, this project in particular was, uh, you know, a pretty unique one. What are some of the things that you learned through this project, and what do you think um, we learned about Indeed in the process? Uh, one thing that was very clear was um, we don't build ventilators, but we do help people get jobs, and we do anything and everything to make that happen. And um, how important our value, uh, values and strategy um, are to make clients successful. You know, um, you talk about like getting closer to the hire. Uh, one thing that the uh, team did in this is uh, understanding the whole journey of um, the um, up from the apply to the hire process. So if a client is coming and saying to us like, I need. Um, thousand applicants and the team would always say like okay what do you do with those thousand applicants what is the next step uh how do you screen them does it go to your ats is there anything that we could help um so to understand the full um hiring cycle and being able to get um as far as we can in that hiring cycle uh, was one thing that um we did um, and then demonstrating the value of pay for performance and uh, using data-driven decisions. Um, so we talk about all of these, but um, everything comes together and you can see the success, uh, which was really good. Um, and our work with NHS started in times of crisis, but it's um, gone ahead. And now um, it's we have formed this like deep partnership with them based on um, the trust that we've built. And um, it also demonstrates to me how important our mission is. Uh, you know, helping people get jobs has a profound impact uh, on the world. And um, I think I'm super proud to uh, be able to play a part in it. This has been a fantastic conversation. Just to, to wrap things up, um, one of the things that I think is really interesting is that, you know, obviously, um, you know, this has been an incredibly difficult and challenging time for for everyone all over the world. Um, but it has been an opportunity also to to learn more and to see things in a new light. Um, on, a, on a personal note, are there any other things that have happened over the last few months that leave you optimistic uh, for the for the future? Yeah, um, thinking back, um, I think like when the whole COVID thing started, uh, when we started to work from home, one day my daughter and I decided to go to uh, one of the elderly couple that lived just two houses away from us to just check in um, and see how they were doing and if they needed any help uh, uh, with shopping or anything really. Um, and uh, that was when I found out that the elderly lady uh, in that house had um, blood cancer and has been uh, going through chemotherapy and treatments for the last few months. And I had no idea. Um, so I was just like in my own world, like going to work, coming back, spending time with kids. Um, and we have um, all these WhatsApps and Facebook um, to have a million connections, but I failed to make a connection with actual human people that just live two houses away from us. And um, it's sad that it took a pandemic for me to make that connection. Um, but that's something that I want to keep doing. Like, um, look around me. There are so many uh, things that I can do and uh, make life beautiful. Um, another thing was um, 
over the Easter um, long weekend, we put up a tent in the back garden and um, the kids were so happy. Um, so they are happy um, with small things. It doesn't have to be like a, a lovely holiday somewhere um, exotic, like even a tent in the back garden makes them happy. We have found so many nice places around um, our neighborhood in the house. So looking for beautiful things, uh, around you um, is what taught me. Um, so life can be simple, but still beautiful is what I learned out of this pandemic. Wow, well, Deepa, thank you so much for the conversation today and for sharing so much about your story and this incredible work that you've been doing. And thank you for being here and thank you for everything that you do for Indeed. Thank you for having me, Chris. <laughs>